Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar uh, in conversation with our next Expand the Canon series, Staged Reading, which is Cottagers and Indians. We will be welcoming this afternoon Vanessa Vivas, our director, Drew Hayden Taylor, our playwright, and Jonathan Taylor, our native language and cultural consultant. Um, yes, once again, I am Sharon McCune, the curator of the new Expand the Canon series at Picked Classic Theater. I am decidedly not Alan Stanford, your usual webinar host, in case you were wondering. Uh, I decided to give Alan the day off, because why not? Yeah, why not? It's beautiful here in Pittsburgh. It's about, oh, 60-ish degrees, maybe 55, doesn't matter. The sun is shining. The geese are landing and eating things out of the grass on their way to wherever they're going, which is not here. And um, we welcome any and all questions you may or may have may not have, because think of one, why not, uh, towards the last uh, five to 10 minutes of our webinar, webinar excuse me, uh, please type them in. And our fantastic uh, producer of our webinars, the glorious Catherine Kolos, our general operations manager, will type them to me and we will try and get them answered. Um, and if there's something that we can answer live as we are discussing, we will be more than happy to do so. Uh, as we get going, if you would allow me, please, I would like to do our land acknowledgement. I ask for a moment to acknowledge the traditional lands of those who came before and those who are here today in the present day in what is known as the Greater Pittsburgh Region, the Erie, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy made up of the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Seneca, Tuscarora, and Cayuga, Kaskaskia, Lenape, Masawomek, Mississauga, Osage, Shawanwaki, Shawnee, Susquehannock, Wyandotte, Yuchi, and the pre-European contact cultures of the Adena, Hopewell, and Menajihala. I thank you. Um, once again, thank you very much for joining us in conversation with the director of our next staged reading, uh, Cottagers and Indians, Vanessa Vivas, our playwright, Drew Hayden Taylor, and Jonathan Taylor, our native language and cultural consultant. This, uh, this latest reading will be performed this coming Sunday, December 12th at Rodef Shalom in Levy Hall at 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. It is free to the public, but reservations are required so that we can keep social distancing in place. So if you would visit our website and reserve your tickets, please come spend a couple of hours of your time uh, this afternoon or, or th this coming Sunday at 2 p.m. or evening at 7. So let me get started with introductions. Vanessa Vivas, our director, is a Venezuelan actress, writer, and director, and multi-hyphenate creator based in Brooklyn, New York. She recently had her New York City stage production debut as the stage manager for Randomly Specific Theater's Last Chance for Mama at the Chain Theater. She has received, received excuse me, honorable mentions for first Best First Time Director, female, and Best Women Short at the Independent Shorts Award for her directorial film debut, Transplant. She is a recent graduate of Point Park University's Theater Arts Program, and we are welcome, so ecstatic and grateful to be a part of, oh, that you are here being a part of this year's Expand the Canon series. Thank you, Vanessa. Jonathan Taylor, a native language and cultural consultant, is an Anishinaabe from the Curve Lake First Nation in Ontario, Canada. He writes poetry and is an Anishinaabe Moen language consultant and teaches it to children and adults in his community. Jonathan's writing has appeared in Red Ink Magazine, the Yellow Medicine Review, Quill's Canadian Poetry Journal, and the Muckleshoot Review, and he belongs to the Turtle Clan. Our playwright, Drew Hayden Taylor, is an Ojibwe from Curve Lake First Nations in Ontario, Canada, as well, and is a member, uh, is a member of the Otter Clan, he just told us. And he's worn many hats in his literary career from performing stand-up comedy at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., to being the artistic director of Canadians Canada, excuse me, premier native theater company, Native Earth Performing Arts. He is the author of more than 20 plays, resulting in almost 100 productions. He is self-described as a contemporary storyteller. His exploration of the storytelling tradition has explored many boundaries. And in the last few years, it has seen him proudly serve as a writer in residence of the Burton House in Dawson City, Yukon, the University of Michigan, 
the University of Western Ontario, the University of Lundberg, Germany, Ryerson University, Wilfrid Laurier, as well as the host of Canadian theater companies, i.e. i.e. Cahoots Theater, everything should be called Cahoots Theater, Blythe Theater, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Please welcome to this afternoon's web webinar, Vanessa, Jonathan, and Drew. That was a mouthful. Uh, Holy and I made it. You killed I'm it. Still here. You killed it. Well, I killed. I killed lots of things. I'm not sure that I killed the introduction. Um, if we can uh, do a little bit of background, I'm gonna give just a little hint, and the two of you can decide how to answer. Drew and Jonathan, you are related. How? We are cousins. Our uh, our mothers were sisters. Excellent. And can you, uh, in each in turn, if you could take a few minutes, tell us what it was like growing up in Ontario as a, as a, as an American, <laughs> um, but on the same continent, we don't know that. And there are, I, I also should note that I don't know if how many of our viewers know this. There are no reservations in the state of Pennsylvania. Mm, really? Really? That's crazy. Because the uh, a particular treaty that was drawn up in 1794 between the Seneca Nation and then President George Washington, oh, kind of got ruined by President John <clears throat> F. Kennedy, and they flooded uh, and built the Kinzua Dam in 19 completed uh, construction in 1965, thereby flooding out the Seneca Nation, and they had to transplant over the border into New York. And since then, there is, there are no reservations. I did not know that. I uh, spent a summer at uh, Penn State University, uh, <laughs> at State College, uh, 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 what's it called? Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Center Stage, or the, the theater company at there. They did one of my comedies. And I remember driving to a powwow nearby. I don't remember where or whatever it was, but that was, that was my introduction to the wonderful world of Pennsylvania. Driving through those beautiful mountains, or like not our big hills. I don't know if they're right. classified. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think they qualified just barely as mountains, and that's why they're called that. But yeah, they're big hills. <laughs> yeah. Well, but to, get, to answer your question, if I can, uh, I'll go before Jonathan. Um, I always like to tell people I come from both a big and a small family. I come from a big family because my mother was the oldest of 14 which is what used to happen before they had the internet. And um, I also come from a uh, small family. I'm a single child of a single parent. And my mother blames that on the fact that when I was born, I was supposedly 11 pounds, 13 ounces. So evidently, what's that? I believe her. <laughs> so evidently, I gave my mother both quantity and quality. Mm. You will be here all hour, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but I'm, uh, I'm here all week. Try the bus crap. Um, uh, but uh, no, growing up here, like for me, uh, I'm I'm uh, uh, quite a bit older than Jonathan. Uh, you know, growing up here, um, there wasn't a lot to do. It's like a small town anywhere. You can only climb so many trees or go swimming so often. And when I was growing up, we had two television stations. And this is way before uh, internet, way before uh, cable or satellite. And those stations were frequently, and here's a term only your older listeners will know, the, the channels were frequently snowy. I know that term. And uh, <laughs> um, so I developed the yeah, fun for reading. Rabbit, uh, no, we had a big, uh, big aerial that I had to go out manually to turn depending on which channel we wanted to watch. Um, but uh, so I developed the fondness for reading because uh, reading would take me to far off places that I never thought I'd get a chance to see. I would, uh, it would introduce me to amazing, uh, fascinating people. I'd have amazing adventures. And um, I, used to, I remember thinking it wouldn't be cool if someday I told stories about my community and sent them off to the world. Uh, never really expecting that to happen. And lo and behold, here we are. Here we are. How about you, Jonathan? Well, uh, growing up, we were surrounded by family. As Drew said, we have a big family. I have three brothers or two two other brothers as well. Um, growing up, uh, we heard the language, um, uh, Nishnab Amwan, which, which is what the Ojibwe speak. Um, I played baseball. I swam. 
we climbed trees. Uh, mm -hmm. We did we did lots of stuff. Um, I I, I fell into uh, reading like Drew. I love reading. Um, from my mom reading to my brothers and I, um, and that led to writing as well. And um, it's um my community is very important to me. And it's um it's a it's a source of pride for myself. And um, you don't you don't really know recognize how special it is when you are young. It's not until you get older that you really appreciate your community. And we are blessed to come from such a beautiful community with so many um, quality people. And um, it's a great place. It, I had a great childhood and. Um, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't trade it for anything. It was. A, it was a great experience. Um, growing up, mm -hmm. and and getting a chance to hear that first language that that our people spoke before mm -hmm. English, right? Um, right? And Drew and I, um, I was talking with my cousins and um, uh, some other cousins, and we're we're among the last ones that will hear that every day, that heard that every day mm -hmm. in our household. So, um, yeah, it was. It, I I really. Love my community, and I enjoyed. I had a great childhood here, and um, yeah, that's that's about it. Vanessa, how about you? What was your childhood like? My childhood was um, not the most traditional. I was born in Venezuela, and so I lived there till I was eight. And Venezuelan families, um, when it comes to storytelling, are extremely. I think there's a little bit of a, a, a similarity. Um, with Ojibwe because they're very lively and we will gather and tell stories and have dinner parties where we just tell stories and laugh and eat together. And so I think that's probably where the storytelling, the storyteller um, was born in me was just those like gatherings we used to have with friends and the communities we had in Venezuela. Um, then when I was eight, I... My family moved, my entire family, my immediate family to Qatar, where I sort of um, began to speak English because I didn't speak English before that. And then I went through like a British schooling system, an American schooling system. And then I became sort of this hybrid of different cultures and influences because I had a Venezuelan household, a Venezuelan origin. Yet I was growing up in this international mosh posh community with my friends who were from, we had a friend from every continent. We were sort of like a diversity stock photo as a friend group. And we hit all the marks, we, hit, we checked all the boxes. And then at the same time, I was also looking to come in to school in the US. So it was sort of, I've had a lot of rebirths with my identity about what I call myself, how I tell people, um, where, where I where I tell them I'm from. So, I mean, I think it's, I've had, I've been very fortunate and very lucky to have such a loving, supporting family when it comes to um, pursuing something like theater, just because it's not a traditional, uh, like Latino parents, Venezuelan parents are very much like, you must be a doctor or a lawyer or you must have a full-time job. And I'm like, I want to freelance. <laughs> like, okay, well, we love you. Fine. Um, so it's been a process with that, but I'm extremely lucky to have such a supporting family. And yeah, that's, that's the gist. That's a good gist. Um, can I go back to you for a minute, Jonathan? Did you, did I hear you correctly? You said you're like the last generation that's going to hear the language spoken every day. Yeah, yeah, we 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 are. Um, uh, both Drew, Drew's mother and, and my mother were fluent, and that mm -hmm. was their first language, and that's the only language they knew. Much like Vanessa, um, up until they started going to school, mm -hmm. and um, our our family is very lucky. Our, our our Taylor family is very lucky because we um, we've held on to that language, and we have. Um, I'm a language teacher, mm -hmm. um, and we have two more language teachers in our, in our family coming from one of our um, aunties who, who was a, a great language teacher that we had in our community. So our family is blessed that way that we carry on that, um, that um, tradition of, of speaking our language. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you were always drawn to? 
Um, like specifically teaching, like you both, you were both drawn to books, right? And Drew's led him to think that he could tell stories, like carry on that tradition. Did you did you think that you were going to be the the carrier of language? No, no, not not. What, what did you never in my wildest dreams did I ever think that I was going to become a teacher mm -hmm. um, <laughs> or work with, I, I've, I've taught K to 12, so kindergarten to grade 12. And um, I've, I've, I've recently started teaching adults, but um, yeah, no, it, it's, uh, it's one of my aunts tried to get me to um, go and sub staff here at our community daycare and, and mm -hmm. work with our kids here a long time ago. But my mom told her that I was too cross. So it, was too, <laughs> well, it wouldn't be a good fit. So I, I, I never imagined working with children, but it's been so rewarding. And I, I, it's been so I just learned this morning that one of our youth, one of our boys um, just signed uh, uh, just signed to go to a college in uh, Missouri, I believe, um, to pitch for a college down there. So it's um, and he's one of he's one of the first um, one of the first group of children that I worked with. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm very happy and proud of him. And it's it's such a gift to watch our youth shine. Um, yeah, you, you, you kind of look like a proud uncle right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, I'm very, very proud um, of, of my community. And especially when you get a chance to see um, our, our, our youth especially succeed. It's, it's such a beautiful thing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Drew, how did you how did you fall into playwriting then? How did you, how did you, did you start doing stand up? Did you start doing acting? Did you start doing, what did you start doing first that led you into playwriting? No, I, I've only ever been a writer. Um, I only did stand up once. Um, well, that explains a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, no, the kidding. I don't know if you guys remember the opening of the, um, of the Museum of the American Indian in Washington, DC about 15 years ago or whatever. They had a week-long celebration of indigenous uh, arts in, from Mexico, Canada, and America. And one of the things they wanted to do was have a night of, uh, of indigenous humor. So they got the two leading um, uh, comedians, one out of America and one out of Canada. Um, Don Burnstick from Canada and... Um, Oh, I can't remember. The name has, has escaped me from the States. Anyways, they contacted me and asked if I wanted to um, MC and open for them. Yeah. And my first reaction was, no, I'm not a comedian. I'm a humorist. I, um, I, I, I write funny things on paper, but I don't perform them. Um, but then I suddenly realized, when am I going to get another opportunity to stand center stage at the Kennedy Center. Um, any dreams I ever had of a, of a career in interpretive dance have long since evaporated. Um, so I said yes, and I got a chance to actually get up, do do eight minutes, I think it was. I've, I've, I've taken the best stuff from 15 years of writing, and just my best stuff, went up, did it, and I, I can understand the appeal of why stand-up comedians do it. The adrenaline rush is amazing, right? But then I was sort of thinking, okay, I've done it once at the Kennedy Center. Where do you go from there, right? Do I want to go to Bismarck uh, and do the yuck yucks in Bismarck? Actually, Branson. Uh, you want to go to Branson. That's where you want to Branson, go. Branson. That's it. That's it. But anyways, getting back to your original question, um, I became a playwright primarily because um, – I can't do anything else, so I became a writer. I have no serviceable talents, so I started imagining things for a living. Um, and you know, for me, seriously though, but for me, becoming a playwright is the next logical progression uh, in 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 how I grew up. Um, as uh, Jonathan would tell you, I both I. Uh, and he lived right across from uh, our, where our grandparents were. And during the summer, they'd have these huge bonfires. And family and friends would come around, sit around the bonfires and tell funny stories. And I grew up listening to these funny stories and people telling these stories. And um, in Canada, in the 80s and 90s, there, there was this explosion of Indigenous theatre, something I refer to as the contemporary Native literary renaissance. And... Native theater was everywhere and became the chief vehicle for expression for 
native people, you know, primarily because theater is the next logical uh, progression of oral storytelling, taking the audience on a journey using your imagination, your body, and your voice. And indigenous people, group like me and Jonathan, grew up in an oral culture. We know how to tell stories orally, and that's what theater is. So there's this explosion because all these people were coming out and telling their stories on stage. Um, there were a few novelists, but mostly people were doing theater because, you know, your, your prose is so much more so different. You have to have a much more confident approach to the English language. You have to know where your clauses go, your prepositions, your nouns, et cetera, stuff like that. I have 34 published books and I still do not know what a dangling participle or split infinitive is. And I don't care. I hire white people to know that for me. So, so theater just is the, um, for me, the most direct and easiest way to tell a story. Perfect. Thank you for that segue, because here it comes. Why this story? Because please tell the background of how how the story of cottagers and Indians became cottagers and Indians. Um, well, this is an ongoing story that's been happening in this area for about 20 years. Uh, it's based on true stories, true incidents. Um, all these, uh, uh, there's a character here named uh, James Wheatung, who is the real Arthur Copper. And uh, he has been, uh, th this area used to have a lot of wild rice in it. But during the making of the what's called the Trent Severn Waterway, which connected all the small lakes in this area uh, for several hundred miles, um, they raised the water level and, and they drowned out the, um, the wild rice, uh, the construction, the increase in boats, the pollution, and uh, I believe there was even um, logging booms going through. So it, di it died out. And uh, one, of, one of the things, James, James remembered it from his childhood and he wanted to bring it back. And the other reason he wanted to bring it back was uh, he was uh, concerned about the high rates of diabetes in the indigenous community and specifically in Curve Lake. My grandmother was diabetic, my mother was diabetic, I'm diabetic. So he was thinking this as a form of food sovereignty. So he went out and he started planting wild rice in as many lakes as he could for the last 15, 20 years. Now, the big problem as this play discusses is that when wild rice grows, and these lakes were made for wild rice, they're shallow, they're now clean again and lots of sunlight. So it just grew up again, <laughs> using a bad metaphor, like weeds. Mm -hmm. um, and when it grows, it grows two feet above the water and grows thick. So it interferes in boating and swimming and fishing. And the people, who, the non-native people who live around these lakes, um, they have cottages or they have permanent houses. And it's a well-known fact that a lakefront cottage within three hours of Toronto is as expensive as a house in downtown Toronto. So we're talking anywhere from, uh, from $1 million to $2 million for a really nice lakefront property. And a lot of these people feel uh, it, this brings down property values. So this has been happening for a while and I knew about it. Everybody knew about it. It was James doing his thing and we just all sort of accepted it. I wrote an article about it once a couple of years ago for a magazine and it pops up on news all the time because there was a, a very, uh, an organization of um, non-native uh, cottage and homeowners that were trying to stop him. And um, so it would pop up in national news, but this is where things get really interesting. Um, the artistic director of a very well-known, well-respected theater company in Toronto, Tarragon Theater, who, by the way, was um, the artistic director, was born and raised in Venezuela. Um, so there's a strong Venezuela connection with this play, evidently. Um, he was sitting in a cafe in New York City, reading a newspaper or, or a magazine, for some reason, I think it was uh, the, the, or could have been looking at it on his tablet, and I think it was Al Jazeera, but I'm not sure. And he read a story on an international paper about this whole issue. And Curve Lake was at the center of it. 
because of James Wheaton. And he paused and he went, I know somebody from Curve Lake. And then he thought of me, he read the article, he phoned me up, and he asked me if I thought this would make a great, uh, an interesting play. And my first reaction was no. I thought, how dramatically interesting is a bag of wild rice, Minoman? But he said, don't, you know, step back, step back from, because, you know, to me, this is everyday stuff. When you get to hear something every day, it's just sort of like, it's, it's, you don't find it that dramatically interesting. And he said, step back, read all the articles, reread your own article, and think of it dramatically. And I did, and as I, as I said, it was like sitting there, looking me in the face. It, this is one of those cases of a play that actually wrote itself. It was all there. So I sat down, I wrote it. We um, uh, rehearsed it. It ran for five weeks in downtown Toronto. Was sold out for four weeks. They remounted it the last the the, the next year. It ran for three weeks and was sold out for two weeks. So everybody knows. Everybody knows. And yes, it had such. And there were people showing up. One, um, um, they took a busload of. Uh, uh, people from Curve Lake to go see go see the play, and somebody from Curve Lake, I don't know, uh, it may have been Claudia or or somebody like that, but um, somebody was there and they were talking to the, this other person sitting right beside them who um, was non-native, and the, the person said, "I have I just bought a cottage on Kashawanuka Lake, and I'm I came here to see if I'm going to have any problems." <laughs> so there 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 it it became a bit of an issue, and then they ended up touring. The play to what we call the Golden Horseshoe, uh, the um, western side of Lake Ontario, curves around and all the way up to where the St. Lawrence River starts. They turn into places, um, big cities where all the cottagers come from. Mm. So, um, so it, it, it had a it had a small but important tour that sort of spread uh, spread the the news about the issue. Got it. Um. If I remember correctly, well, you both know James. Did you ever harvest rice, Monoman? Either of you? Not me. Did you, John? When we were kids here at Curve Lake School, um, uh, when when I was a student here, uh, we would go down to James's place and we would get in a canoe and we would go out and and he would show us how to harvest that wild rice. So mm -hmm. I've I, I've been out a couple times, mm -hmm. but not in the recent in, in the recent boom, we'll say, because mm -hmm. yeah. it, it's really came it's really um, that Manoman's come back now. So I haven't been out since uh, James has been out uh, planting. Okay, so and of course the big thing the big thing is uh, the traditional way to do it is with a canoe and two two sticks where you bend it over and you knock it off gently. Um, um, you know it's it's that's great to get you get your own supply, but if you what James does to make a living from it is he's gotten this thing that looks like it's out of the Florida Everglades. It's got a big propeller on the back. It's got a scoop on the front, and he can do an entire lake in uh, in in three quarters of a day. And it's like, and that's also one of the things that pisses people off. The fact that I thought he, I thought you're supposed to be doing this with a canoe, not a big, huge, noisy machine. And you know, that's not very traditional. Right. right. It's just another excuse to complain. Right. Right. Well, now, now it's just the noise. Well, now it's just this. Well, now it's just that. Um, where is there, is there an actual arbitration happening? Between James, between the between the government, between actual cottagers that may or may not be bringing some kind of personal suit. Well, I mean, nothing. I, COVID has shut everything down up here, as I assume it has down there. So, and James is pretty inflexible. <laughs> he's <laughs> he's he's pretty dedicated to his his perspective and his goals. Um, I, do, I do not know what, uh, I think it's called Save Pigeon Lake. I think that's the name of the, the, uh, cottager organization. I do not know where they stand, where they stand now. I do not know if there's been any movement because just basically everything's been shut down for the last, uh, three, uh, year and three quarters. Right. What do you, what do you, has, the, has, besides our reading and forgive me, 
Where else has it been done in the States? Has it been done anywhere else in the States? Nope, not in the States. It's a fairly new play. It's only been out about three years, three, maybe four years. But this is, but this is nothing new to any of the Great Lakes, correct? Because the Upper Peninsula of, of Michigan, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Minnesota, right? And probably upstate New York, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do not know what the situation is there. Um, I assume it's it's much the same, but it seems and in and, and Canada too. Um, wild rice grows from I think southern Quebec all the way over to Manitoba, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not just here, but here is the sort of where the the, the flashpoint where it really has ignited and become a very specific issue. Mm. What do you hope that? We'll stay specific to Pittsburgh. What do you hope that that Pittsburgh audience is? Because we're only two and a half hours from the Great Lake, right? Um, right? And now we all know, at least the people watching this webinar, that there are no reservations in the state of Pennsylvania. What do you hope that? Well, give it time. Right. Right. Well, here's hope. Unless we met. Jo Jonathan and I will come down. Yay! Um, great. And start <laughs> just because you're in club. Um, what do you hope? Pittsburgh audiences get from your play? Well, one of the things I've always been a strong proponent of is communication, opening doors, opening windows, letting people understand and know the indigenous way of life. Because I'm, I'm a firm believer that there are more similarities than differences. We're not, we're not, we're not from another planet. We, we have, we have the same, same things you guys uh, do, but there are differences. And some of those different differences are very drastic. One of them being an understanding, a relationship with, and um, with um, the earth, mm. and how how we feel about it, how it's how it's important to us, and uh, and where we fit in that whole spectrum. So what this play does is sort of explain that, sort of talk about the importance of. The water, the land, the trees, the wild rice. It's, these are not things in many um, indigenous belief structures. They're living, they're living things. They have, they have a spirit. They have a purpose on this, on this earth. So that's one of the things I try and do with my writing is sort of try and educate. To enter I do three things when I write. Educate, entertain, and um, hopefully elucidate. Those three things um, to help, to help foster a better understanding of native people because a lot of people when they think of native people they think of protesters they think of land claims residential schools all all political so, uh, things like that but you know the vast majority of us sit at home and watch the simpsons we go fishing uh you know we do stuff like that we're 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 like everybody else but the things that are unique and different i think it's important for what we call the dominant culture to know and understand. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, is there anything to add to that? Well, yeah, I, I, the, the language, our language and culture, like that, that annulment, that wild rice is directly tied to our culture, right? And that's um, fed and sustained us for years um, before um, we had grocery stores, before, like Drew said, before we went shopping in grocery stores, right? So um, I, much like Drew, yeah, we are a lot alike, um, but we have special um, and unique um, differences from the majority. Um, one of them being that language and that ties that ties to our land and and how special um, that land is to us. Right, we're not just all um, powwow singers and powwow dancers. Um, a lot of us are teachers, writers, um, athletes. Um, yeah, we're just the same as everybody else, but we we have a unique um, perspective mm -hmm. on on on, um, on with our own worldview. Mm. Vanessa, um, when I asked you if you would be willing to come direct something uh, as part of this program, you didn't have the play yet. No, <laughs> you said yes first. Um, I what what appeals to you about this play? I love two-handers, first of all. I think like 
plays that are conversations are the most fascinating to me because they're real time. And it's so it's an audience is going through a thought process. And I think that's the most fascinating thing is that you can sort of meditate on what you agree with, what you don't agree with. Um, and I just think that's very intellectually stimulating for me personally, but also for an audience, I think it's fascinating to watch an arc develop in real time without time jumps. It's just sort of you're developing an opinion as you're meeting these characters. Um, and I think what's so fascinating about this piece that you did such a fantastic job balancing, Drew, is that it's it's dealing with really important forgotten topics, food sovereignty, land rights, property rights, racism, privilege. It's dealing with all these heavy, heavy topics, and yet there's such a lightness to it in the way that it's written. And there's this, Arthur is so charismatic, and it makes you want to listen. And Maureen is so funny sometimes that it, you're like, what is this woman talking about? But it makes me want to listen more. So you did such a beautiful job of sort of making these characters three-dimensional and allowing the audience to go through with them and go through their thought process. And I think it's just a beautiful thing to watch and to see real reactions, real real-time reactions from these characters as the story develops, um, as they meet each other. I think it's, it's just beautiful. Cool. Um, what, if any, challenges have you come up against? Because we are working on a, a staged reading contract, which me gives you a total of 26 hours to rehearse. Right. So what, and we still have time. Like we're still, we still have a rehearsal this afternoon. We still have a rehearsal tomorrow. We still have a, a short rehearsal before we do this in front of people on Sunday. What particular challenges have you found with trying to craft something as close to a performance as you can get with 26 hours, music stands, no real costumes per se, minimal blocking, no lights, no sound, right? So it, it is really with words. Right, I mean, the biggest thing that, that, when, that we're focusing on is focus. It's where the focus is going. For stage reading, it's one of the most important things because the way that the play is written too is that it goes from, it switches between presentational and representational. So you have these characters talking to the audience, telling a story to the audience, and yet there's interjections where they turn and they're immediately sort of transported into a scene between two people on stage becomes representational. And then it goes back to a commentary and then it goes back to a scene. And so um, it's been difficult. I've sort of had to come up with inventive ways very simplistic and inventive ways to clarify that, to make sure that the audience knows when they're being spoken to and when they're watching something. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been that's been a challenge, honestly, to to clarify those because there are moments in rehearsal where, where um, one of the actors will have an instinct to tell to be, make it become a scene, but yet it feels it feels flat. It feels like I need to be spoken to, and so I'd right. start switching that. Um, and knowing how to switch that, whether it's using music stance, physicality, vocal quality, um, those have been things that that have come up in the rehearsal process that are a little bit of a challenge mm -hmm. without lighting. Because that's the thing that, that also is in my head, if this is a full stage production, it, lighting would be critical in knowing who's in focus and who's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any questions for either... John or Drew, Vanessa, like any little other tidbits you want to like pull out of Drew's brain before, <laughs> before we head off into. There's uh, nothing in there. <laughs> Actually, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot in there. There is a, there's so much. Are you so much. We're, we're discovering something new every day. We're like, oh, we all have this like communal epiphany. We're like, what? That's what that is. <laughs> Got it. Let's move on. Um, well, I'm wondering actually just personally, if do you, do you think there should be space for audiences to agree with Maureen? I think so. I mean, as I said, as I, as I once said, when I was putting this together, as I tried to make them both understandable and relatable and have a specific perspective, um, I did not want her to be the villain with the black hat, curling a mustache. 
Um, and so I went in with a full understanding of her perspective. Uh, she's got a very expensive home, uh, put a lot of money into it, wants to leave it to her grandkids, and uh, suddenly this stuff pops up just off her dock, and it's this crazy native guy running around doing this, and it, 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 she thinks it's infringing upon her private rights as a homeowner, as a citizen, etc. And um, so I understand Maureen's perspective very, very much, and I'm hoping the audience will too. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, there's been about, I think, five or six productions of this play in Canada, and a lot of the actresses who play Maureen uh, only play her once because they, they just, they, they, they see her as being evil. They see her as being bad, and um, they, they're, they're uncomfortable doing that because it's like, you know, in, in, in Canada, so much of our media, it's interesting, so much of our media is very pro-Indigenous, but so much of our of, of the government and the um, police forces are almost anti-Indigenous. So, um, so these, so frequently you have to take sides, and I think a lot of the actresses just sort of like, I'm I'm very pro-supportive Native, and I, I I'm uncomfortable doing this role. So I'm just like I, I I didn't present her, I didn't write her to be evil. I just wrote her to have a different perspective than the other character. Do you think anybody, have you ever heard of anyone who's seen this, mostly non-natives, who have seen this play and changed their mind? I don't know. I, I don't know. I haven't really come across that yet. I don't know if people would, would actually reach out and, 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 and tell me that they've They've changed their mind either way. Um, I think that would be interesting, mm -hmm. but uh, I've, I have had people, and it's studied in a lot of schools. Uh, just in the last two weeks, I've, I've uh, had Zoom sessions with two classes who study it, and they basically um, uh, really appreciate understanding Arthur's perspective. They know Maureen's perspective already, but they're very, these, these are students in mainstream schools uh, run by the dominant culture, and they said it's really interesting to see why this is happening from uh, an Indigenous perspective. Hmm. And what, so are they, are they studying, what class are they studying it in? Is Believe it or not, there's in, in Ontario, I can only speak about Ontario. I, it is taught all over the place. It's become a very, very popular um, uh, play for study. It's replacing another, a uh, lot of my work, because I, I have uh, 20 plays that have been published. And so uh, there's a whole broad section of them being taught in various schools. But uh, a lot of my work has replaced this other playwright named Shakespeare. You may have heard of him. He hasn't done a lot recently. <laughs> but um, no, the grade, grade 11 Ontario curriculum is experimenting with doing more relevant um, uh, schooling, basically. So they're, they've taken out um, Shakespeare and is putting more contemporary, Canadian, not necessarily Canadian, but just stuff that is not... Um, um, what is it, 400, 500 years old, uh, mm -hmm. that the students can better relate to rather than just whine about the language. So they've been, it's been this way for about uh, three years, I think, three, four years. And do you think it's going to continue to grow that way? It would be nice. It would be nice. Um, as I said, the educational system here is embracing Indigenous literature very, very well. We Today, the, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation online just released the top, I don't know, I think it was 20... Canadian nonfiction books of 2021 and almost half half of them I think nine were native that's exciting so there's a big support for indigenous arts here up here um Jonathan what else do you teach besides language oh, I that's this is the only thing I teach is language that's um yeah that's specifically what I went to school <clears throat> for is to um learn how to teach uh learn how to teach Ojibwe and write report cards and all that fun stuff that people get to do, right? A, B, C, D. Yeah. 
yeah, F, yeah. I, but, yeah. To echo um, um, what Drew was saying about the uh, curriculum, um, yeah, our local school board has has um, made a push to include more local writers in there. And actually, um, I was contacted by one of our um, uh, our our band members, our our community members that um, works in the high school, and she wanted to um, get some of the um, uh, anthologies that my my work has been published in. And one of the cool things about that is um, there was three. There was one. Uh, a journal, Yellow Medicine Review, which was published uh, a long time ago that actually Drew and I and another um, one of my best friends, we were all featured in that in that one journal. And um, that was a pretty proud moment for me to see um, our, our our writers and our authors and our community shine like that. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 really important that um, that's promoted, too. And um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, other than other than um, Ojibwe, I, I, that's all I teach. Well, would you want would you want to teach your cousins plays? Since you, especially, I mean, it's, let's let's just let's pick this one because this is the one we're talking about because you are familiar, very familiar. With I, the I, I, I suppose I could give it a go. But, uh, <laughs> I love that enthusiasm. Right there, <laughs> like, I can uh, give it a go. Yeah, because it's so like because it's tied to the community. I I, I probably would because um, <clears throat> it's um, you know, it, it's really important that we reconnect with not only our language but our past ways of how we used to live, and and that that Menominee when we go out Menominee is, is the act of actually harvesting that wild rice. Mm -hmm. So when we go out and we Menominee we're connecting back to the past, to our ancestors, to the creator, um, to old life ways that um, used to sustain us fully. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, that it's an interesting thought to, to think of me teaching that, but um, I definitely would promote it. Right. Because um, of course it's, it's, it's a community driven um, play and it's, mm -hmm. um, it's a, uh, Anishinaabe related, so it's it's related to us, right? So, it w it's it's a very important piece, and it, it brings up um, both valid points from both sides. Mm -hmm. I, I can see both sides, and um, of of the uh, of the picture, you know. What do you think? Since we're still on it, since we're on education, what do you think? Oh, how do I frame this question? Because Canada is so far ahead at recognizing, maybe not the government, but in certain ways, Canada is so far ahead of the United States. <clears throat> and just acknowledging Indigenous populations, right? But the fact that, that you're talking about schools replacing Shakespeare with Native writers, especially you, but lots of native writers and now there's a book list that almost half right how can how can we how do we how do we do that here how do we start i don't know that i mean if i knew that kind of thing i'd be a much wealthier person um i mean i've had a, I, i've had a few kicks at the american can i had a uh, a play in a Lort theater, I think it's called, mm -hmm. um, in um, uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, oh, that'll set your career on fire here in the States. No, it didn't. Uh, I've had I've had a couple plays done by a native theater company in LA and, and um, San Diego. Na uh, goodness, I can't even remember the name. Uh, not native voices. Is it native voice. Anyways, whatever. Um, I don't know. I don't know if there's an interest out down there for indigenous literature as it is. Um, I mean, I think one of the greatest breakthroughs I've seen in the last couple months or last year or two was the fact there are now two indigenous sitcoms on American television. You got Rutherford Falls and um, Reservation Dogs. Um, 
is it reservation dogs or reservation boys something like that um which is like i've been i have been trying to get an indigenous sitcom off the ground forever i find this is also amazing and fabulous and so there is movement there i think that's a good sign um uh, i the the the, the Native theater company I mentioned that that's in LA and uh, San Diego. They work out of the uh, out of um, uh, a, a muse uh, sorry a museum uh, theater in in LA, and they um, they they did a um, their audience came in and they did a study with their audience and an uncomfortably large amount of the population in California one did not know that there were still native people alive in America and only discovered that when all these casinos started opening up, right? It was, they, they, now usually the only connection people have with indigenous culture is casinos, right? So there's a, there's, so these two sitcoms I think is really cool, really interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to see where this is going to go. Uh, I think there's uh, native voices at the office. That's it. Yes, 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 yes. We've had, we've had Randy and Jeannie on this. Randy, yes, Randy and Jeannie. I love them yeah. so much. Um, because and and do you, it seems like again, it's just it's just getting going, right? So how do we keep the momentum? Well, it's up to you guys who program theaters to sort of, I mean, this, 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 um, this is a, a good step forward. What's the name of this program again that, this, that you guys are doing? Oh, it's called the Expand the Canon series. Like, I mean, that's perfect. That's a perfect name for it. And I think, like, um, I, I had a play produced at, at uh, uh, Penn State University this some winter the summer theater company there. And the guy said, when he programmed it, he said, funny is funny. It was one of my comedies. He said, funny is funny regardless of the culture. And he programmed it. And that's just it. We have, um, as in, I'm speaking for all indigenous writers, we write a wonderful cross section of theater. We write dramas, we write comedies. Uh, there's even been one or two musicals out there. There's, there's basically, you know, my personal one and one of my comedies, I did a comedy called uh, the Berlin blues about um, a German business conglomerate that comes to a small central Ontario first nation community wanting to build the world's largest native theme park called Ojibwe world because it's Ojibwe tastic with such things as bumper canoes, um, uh, medicine, Ferris wheels, a 44 meter high dream catcher with interlacing laser beam webbing that keeps killing all the birds. And the big draw is a production of Dances with Wolves, the musical. And I wrote this about 15 years ago and it, it actually premiered in LA at Native Voices. And, um, you know, so my personal dream has always been, that's it, yes, 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 that's it. I've always wanted, I've always wanted to do, you know, back then, Dances with Wolves, the musical. musical. But, uh, and I, I heard somewhere that somebody's been trying to do it for, actually been trying to do it. And I don't that know where that's awesome. I Yes, yes, <laughs> that, that would be funny. But, um, so anyways, uh, so I think there's, there's hope. I just, it's up to programmers to get more native uh, criteria out on the stage, whether, whether it's Canadian or American. Right. I, I we just have a stronger tradition up here in Canada of theater. You know, I was at some theater festival in the States and I think seven or eight of the, um, of, of the playwrights there were, were Canadian. Like, you know, we, it's an industry up here. Right. It's not a curiosity. Right. I don't even know if we're, I don't even know if it's a curiosity yet. Um, it's different. I think we could say that, but I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's enough to say it's a curiosity because I think like we were, I was just, I was discussing this with somebody else. I'm um, right. It seems just to get any other marginalized community a seat at the table. Right, like for the first time in history, 
all the new plays on Broadway are by black authors, right? Which is great. And yet it's still during a pandemic. So it's not like they can fill the house. It's not like they can see how well it's going to do. This is a really bad barometer to do it in. And as great as it is, all of these playwrights are thinking and all of the other playwrights that haven't been done, right? Just specific to black playwrights. Well, how long is it going to last? Are they gonna use this as the barometer, right? A pandemic Broadway and go, well, it didn't sell well, so we don't have to do it again. Right. So, I mean, it could it could be the same for it could be the same for native playwrights. It could be the same for Venezuelan playwrights. It could be right. Pick a marginalized community and we're going to have the same problem. So I guess that that is one of the the good steps forward um, was was the the producer at Penn State. Any particular marginalized Repre uh, a representative. The, the okay. producer at Penn State, uh, 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 older white male. You may have met one or two in your travels. I may have met one or two in my travels, right? So I, but I guess the other, the other thing is then, how do we help? How do we help start conversations with people who don't want to have conversations? In power. Right. Because because there's right. So there's plenty of people right, of color. Look, the whole panel. We yay us. Right. But not all of us are going to be in a position of power. To actually right, because then the board has to approve or the artistic director has to approve or the casting director tries to do it and nothing comes of it. I don't know. It's kind of a rhetorical question, but does anybody yeah, have an I, I don't know. I don't have an answer. Right. I just I remember I just sit in my room and make things up. <laughs> and then publish them. <laughs> and ca and cash the checks. Right, and cash the checks. I don't know what would you, what would you like to see? If you if you could if you could look at in let's say 5 years. What would you like to see the theater? This is for everybody. What would you like to see let's say theater? What would you like the theaterscape to look like? Oh, I'd, I'd like I'd like it to be representative of the, the countries, right? Um, you know, it's like when, when you get into these discussions, a lot of people think, you know, you're trying to, you're, what, like what I, what I just said about Shakespeare, replacing Shakespeare, that we want to replace all the, all the, uh, all the non-native, all the white writers. And that's not true. I, um, you know, when I go home at night and I watch television, the vast majority of what I watch is, is white television and I enjoy it. But there's a lot to be said for variety, for diversity. I would like to see that diversity represented all over the place. Not not replacing a white play, but sort of augmenting it, saying, you know, you you write about this, this is we're gonna write about this too, and this is our perspective on that particular topic. And I don't think it's a bad thing. I do you know, and I, I will acknowledge up front that native people can on occasion, write a bad play too. <laughs> Where so I've I've uh, I've written one or two in my past life. So um, uh, just keeping that keeping that uh, that in in mind. Yeah, it would be nice just to see the the representation out there of the indigenous face. You watch American television. You've got you've got shows featuring Asian people. You've got shows featuring uh, African-American, all these different people. But other than these two shows, which were, I think, primarily pushed through by indigenous people, um, uh, we're not really that well represented right. on television or in the American stage. In the Canadian stage, yes, right. um, but uh, not, not so much in America. Vanessa, how do you I mean, I think... Echoing everything that Drew said, uh, I would love to see way more indigenous stories on the American stage. I feel like I haven't ever, we were actually just talking about this, even the way that indigenous monuments are represented in, in media. I remember hearing about Mount Rushmore in kids shows when I was abroad, when I was in Qatar. I remember hearing about Mount Rushmore, but I didn't know about Crazy Horse until recently, the last couple of years, even just 
things like that as well, not just in on the stage, but as on TV, film, animation, movies, like all all of it. I think it there needs to be there there are stories that need to be heard that are not being heard right now. And I think even further along that, speaking as a member of the Latino Latinx community, um, also hearing stories that are written by writers of color, but are not intrinsically tied to a trauma or intrinsically tied to a struggle story. Because I think that it can very easily, that association can can become very detrimental. Mm -hmm. Because then you have this this whole thing where where people are are telling me, "Oh, you're Venezuelan. Well, I'm so sorry." And it's it's sort of an awkward exchange where I'm like, "Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate the sentiment." However, it's also it's it's not it's not all intrinsically tragic. Right. Like it becomes a stereotype. You are now the representation for your entire culture, exactly. the entire country. Yeah. It's now become one stereotype. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for that comment, uh, Rexio 1934. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Without any knowledge of the play, they're coming to the play just by watching us be wackadoodle, which is fantastic. Um, Jonathan, what would you like to see? Well, uh, to tell you the truth, I've just been thinking about how bumper canoes could solve this um, wild rice war. Um, <laughs> See, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm ahead of the, the, the we, loop yeah, here. There we go. We put, the, we put uh, Maureen and Arthur in bumper canoes. We just let them go. There's a sequel. You're welcome. Um, I, I, one, I just, as long like, as they have those, the bumper the, the travels as well right? and they flap each other out, yeah. But... Um, yeah, more representation is always um, good, and and, and and like Drew said, with, with Reservation Dogs, um, and, and those other shows, um, it's it just it shines a light on how beautiful um, Native people, Indigenous people are, and um, just just to see that um, those shows on TV is a huge source of pride no matter what type of um, indigenous or native um, person has created it, right? Um, so more representation is, is basically all I have to offer to this is that's what I would like to see more of as well. Awesome. And on that note, I'm going to say thank you to Vanessa Vidas, Drew Hayden Taylor, and Jonathan Taylor for joining us today to promote our next reading of Cottagers and Indians, which will be at Rhoda Shalom and Lee Hall this coming Sunday at 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. Thank you very much to the Allegheny Foundation for their support. Thank you, all of us, all of all of us, all of you for joining. If you need to uh, make a reservation, please visit the PIC website and make a reservation so we can keep you socially distanced and safe. And if there are anything else, what am I missing, Catherine? Yes, please finish the subscription. Get yourself a subscription to the last two shows um, in our 25th anniversary season. End game and boys in the band. For now, I am Sharon McCune, the curator of the Expand the Canon series. On behalf of myself, Alan Stanford, the artistic and executive director, and Catherine Colos, the general operations manager, be safe. Have a good weekend. We'll see you on Sunday at Rota Shalom. Thanks, everybody. Bye.